I'm your host. Uh, with me today is Phil Barnes, Marketing Director for North Star Vets, and Dr. Kim Hammer, who is Veterinary Director for the Robbinsville location, which is the first location. Uh, there were two, Robbinsville and Maple Shade. Uh, and also, Kim is a specialist in internal medicine. Uh, I'm, I happen to be a big fan of North Star, probably a big financial supporter of North Star <laughs> with uh, all of the animals that we have. Uh, the folks are great. Uh, they do things uh, above and beyond. So, uh, Kim, tell us a little bit about yourself and mm -hmm. how you got in. I always ask this question. Mm -hmm. What made you become a vet? <laughs> Well, I am, um, I am a, a cliche in the veterinary world. I was uh, 11 years old and we had to do book reports and um, my friend took the, the, the career you know, that I wanted for the career report of being a horse trainer. So I said, well, what's the second best thing I could pick? And that was as a large animal veterinarian, a horse veterinarian. And part of the career report was going on, um, you know, interviewing someone in the field. And so I had a a really um, great veterinarian, Dr. Werner in Connecticut, who took me on rounds one weekend um, in his truck to see all the different animals, and I was sold from there. Fell in love with the, you know, with the the career, and then just happened to really like science and biology, and it kind of fit together for me. So now, do you do you work with? And I I never I never knew whether they did or not. But do you work with large animals, or is it mainly the dogs, cats, smaller mm -hmm. types of animals? Now? I work exclusively with dogs and cats. Um, usually in veterinary school you're often tracking towards one or the other and I did start out um, wanting to do equine practice but then gravitated towards doing cats and dogs and, and that's what I do exclusively. Interesting. It has to be a little less strenuous. I watched Dr. Paul mm -hmm. on, on TV mm -hmm. and I'm not sure I'd want to be in some of the situations he yeah. is in. <laughs> yes. Large animal is extremely physically demanding and um, it is very hard. They, they, they work very, very hard, those veterinarians. Interesting. Now your specialty is internal medicine. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that because I'm not sure how many people realize that there are different specialties within veterinary practices. Mm -hmm. So internal medicine is basically um, anything that, that's going on with the body that is basically internal. So we deal with a lot of endocrine diseases like diabetes, and Cushing's disease, which is elevation in cortisol levels. We deal with liver problems and kidney problems. Um, we do specialized procedures um, such as abdominal ultrasounds. We do endoscopy, just like if you got a, you know, an upper GI endoscopy, you know, we would do the same type of thing. Um, we can do colonoscopies. No one really wants to talk about that today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, so a lot of times what will happen is if you're a veterinarian, if your pet has a very complicated problem and your veterinarian wants to get um, an expert opinion on that particular problem, they would send it to us. And in addition to me, we have other people who specialize in other things like ophthalmology and dermatology and surgery, et cetera. So. Interesting. It, it just dawned on me that I was trying, you know, you try to remember where you meet people mm -hmm. and, and besides the show and whatever. I met you when you did the ultrasound on one of my dogs that Dr. Lisa Allmiller sent over because oh. her comment was, you want to take, you want Dr. Hammer to see Amber <laughs> because she will be able to do a better job because this is her specialty and she's really good at it and you have the facilities to do the better job as well. So it, it yeah. dawned on me, of course we found yeah. nothing, but good. which is good. That's great. <laughs> the bad news is we had to do it. The good news was we found nothing other yeah. than she was a picky eater. Mm -hmm. But no, it, and the part that fascinated me when I was there with you, and as I keep thinking about it, it was the compassion, it was the caring on your on your part, as well as the everyone else on the staff. No one took anything for granted. It was all about the dog. It was all about her being comfortable. Uh, it, it was very interesting. It was an interesting experience. So I thank you. I oh, just realized thank it. You. <laughs> Now, one of the things we were going to talk about today was um, something I didn't realize, blood drives mm -hmm. and dogs or, and or cats donating blood. So right. yep. talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So we don't think about it, but just like when people need transfusions, dogs and cats have medical conditions that require transfusions, whether they have you know, a bleeding you know, in their abdomen, if they've been hit by a car. Certain types of immune problems can result in, in low red blood cell counts, anemia, and so they need blood products also, and you have to give them the blood products that is the same as their species. So dogs need dog blood, cats need calf blood, 
And so in order to provide that, we have to have dogs and cats who want to give blood in order to have those products available for our, our sick patients. And how do you find out whether the dog or cat wants to give blood? I, mean, like, <laughs> I, donate, I donate every, what, 66 days or whatever it is, mm -hmm. the, and they've asked me. Uh, do you how, do we, how do I ask my dog if she wants to donate? <laughs> how do I know if she's a good potential donator? Yeah. So there's lots of things that we look for in, in a good blood donor, and, um, and temperament is one of them. And so we know that dogs don't really volunteer to, to give blood. It's their human counterparts who say this is a great thing to do to give back to, to pets who are in need. And so we look for, um, for dogs who are um, friendly, who are happy to see us and happy to come to the vet, which some dogs are, um, who are relatively calm and can lay still for several minutes while we do the blood draw. And, um, and don't seem you know, terrified or overly traumatized by the experience. And so it's mainly you interpreting your dog's willingness to <laughs> come and give blood. Interesting. How long does, how long does it take to, for a dog to donate blood? Because I know how long it takes for a human, you're, you're, you're gonna spend a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. So does a dog, when you take, and how much blood does a dog donate? Mm -hmm. One so a uh, full, our dogs can donate um, a full size unit, a pint of blood. It's the same volume that a person donates. Um, in our some of our smaller dogs who are around the 50 pound mark, um, we'll get a half a unit, which is about 250 milliliters, which is a little under okay. half a pint. Um, and um, but dogs that are 55, 60 pounds or greater can give a full unit. It takes maybe five or ten minutes. Um, and oftentimes we'll have owners be in the room with them and um, it's a calming effect for them and um, but it does not take very long. But for some dogs five or ten minutes sitting still for five or ten minutes is a true challenge so we understand that. <laughs> I, I can see what you say it depends on the personality of the dog. Yeah. I mean I have two dogs who probably would never cut it. <laughs> One's a ther one who's a therapy dog who is used to lying still mm -hmm. and not she would not get upset at all. Yeah. Now, are there different types of blood for dogs? I mean, like in humans, you have A, you have O, you have B positive, mm -hmm. you have positives, whatever. Mm -hmm. What about dogs and yeah. cats? So dogs and cats do have um, blood types just like humans do. They're named differently. So dogs are, um, they're named by the DEA system, which is just dog erythrocyte antigen, which is erythrocytes, the red blood cell antigen is just the protein that's on the cell that tells you what type it is. And so dogs have, we test them for four different um, types, the 1.1, 1 .1, 4, 5, and 7. Those are the blood types that we look at. And then cats have an AB system, um, which is different from humans, but similar names. So cats can either be A, which is the most common type, um, and about, let's say, 95% of cats are type A. And then there's a very rare blood type called type B, um, and we see that in maybe 5% of the patients um, that we see. Yeah. Is it difficult? Is it difficult for cats, for you to get blood from cats more difficult than dogs, or? Yeah, so for cats, we do have to sedate them um, to, in order to do the blood draws, which makes it a little bit less um, enticing to, to bring our cat in, but we certainly appreciate all the cats who do volunteer, and we have, um, we enlist a lot of employee cats um, who are, are willing to come in and have their cats sedated. They give less often, so usually, you know, every three or four months is um, about the frequency that we have cats give. I have a whole bunch more questions for you. I think we're going to a commercial break. So uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. This is Pet Patrol, Protector of the Pack, and Dr. Kim Hammer is with me. Welcome back to Pet Patrol, Protector of the Pack. This is Alan Braswell, your host. Again, I'm with Phil Barnes, Marketing Director, for North Star Vets and Dr. Kim Hammer, medical director for the Robbinsville facility, uh, and who was kind enough to come down to Maple Shade as we were just talking in between to take care of one of my dogs for me. Uh, question for you. There, I understand that uh, you have a blood drive coming up. Why this time of year? Is there something different between now and other times? Oh. And, and what about the drive? What, how can we help? Yeah. Well, we, we do the drives at different times of the year. Uh, usually we do one or two a year, but we have two coming up and we schedule them both for June. And uh, so the first one's gonna be in Maple Shade. It's gonna be June 23rd. And this is a human animal blood drive. So we're partnering with um, the uh, Blood Council of New Jersey 
they're going to have their RV uh, outside the building, and humans can come and donate blood to them uh, because there's definitely always a need for human blood. And the dogs and cats can come and get screened uh, for the canine and feline blood bank uh, at the Maple Shade location, and Dr. Hamill will be there for that. Um, and then on June 29th, we're going to do it again at the Robbinsville location, and that one is partnered with the Red Cross. And so the Red Cross will be there, and humans can come and donate blood to the Red Cross on June 29th and their pets can be screened for our canine and filet blood, blood bank there uh, in Robbinsville. So we have both events. What's the process for screening a dog? I, I, I would think you show up, the dog sticks out its paw and yeah. take my blood. <laughs> <laughs> what do well, I know? Yeah, so the, the screening process is pretty extensive, and then Dr. Hammer talked a little bit about that. There's you know, requirements before they even come in. In fact, uh, we drive a lot of people to our website, uh, to the blood bank page on the North Star Vets website, okay. and there's a pre-screening process that the owner can take up front to make sure that, um, that their dog or cat would be a, a good candidate to come in for the screening, and then we'll schedule them to come in for the screening. Uh, when they come in, they just take a little bit of blood, and then they will test that blood, and uh, we've a uh, you know, pretty um, extensive process to examine the blood and make sure that it's good, and it's gonna be safe to put into other pets. And so that's what happens at the, the screening process. And then if, if they pass that, then we'll call them back in to donate blood. So that would all be the same day. Similar to when I go to get blood at the Red Cross, they take a sample, they check for whatever they check for, and then they decide whether or not they can take my blood today. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, um, I don't think my dog would ask, but does, do they get a donor card or anything? <laughs> and then how often can they get blood? So dogs and um, cats can give blood every four to six weeks, but they usually are not giving that frequently. Um, we're usually having them give um, every two to three months. Um, is pretty uh, practical for um, for people to have time to bring their pets in to, to donate. Um, they get, in addition to all the screening blood work, which not only looks for infections that they could transmit to another pet, but also looks at their overall health on a yearly basis. So they get, you know, a full picture of their kidney function, liver function, all that. Each time they donate, um, they do get um, a handkerchief and uh, a bag of a uh, bag of biscuits. Do they get a bowl of water to drink before they leave? <laughs> <laughs> and I always tell you, drink that <laughs> hydrate before you leave here. <laughs> yeah. 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 They, always, they always give that instruction. Uh, do you see a greater need now than in the past for blood donations? And are you getting the amount of blood that you need? Um, I do think there is a greater need, and I think it comes from our recognition of all the things that how how advanced veterinary medicine has become and all of the things that we can do for pets that we might not have known to do 20 or 30 years ago and so just recognizing those conditions and then having the availability of blood um, in you know our specialty and emergency hospitals to be able to give it in those emergent situations I think is um, I think is uh, has increased the need for, for blood products. Um, I think just like the, in the human world, in the veterinary world, there's always a need for blood products. Um, we definitely are always looking for, for blood donors and, um, and we're able to pretty much meet our needs for the most part with our, our dog blood donors. Um, cats are a little bit more difficult um, to, to get into the, to the program and so cat blood tends to be a very um, precious commodity. What about synthetics? I know that they talk about that with humans at times, that there can be synthetic blood that mm -hmm. can be used as a replacement. Can you use that with the dogs and cats? You can. So there are some synthetic blood products that, um, that can be used in dogs and cats. Um, one of them was on the market in the United States. It was called oxyglobin, and we used it quite frequently because it could sit on the shelf for two years and it was there when you needed it, whereas our you know, regular blood products, they expire after you know, four to six weeks. Um, but it, it was no longer manufactured um, in the United States, so its availability has been very limited and um, limited you know, us to using actual blood products. In general, um, they have their pros and cons, but in general, a lot of times the actual um, natural blood product tends to be better for, for most situations. Do you ever find yourself in a position where there's a surgery you need to do and the blood isn't available? Um, luckily. We have not had that problem, but that requires a lot of planning ahead um, and making sure that those um, that those products are available. One of the benefits of 
our blood banking program is that because all of our donors come from the local community, we're able to call people and we have a huge pool of, of dogs and cats that we can call when we're in need if we have a particular situation um, where we have or we need a blood product that we don't have on hand, we can call a, a person in to, to emergently donate with their, you know, their pet's blood. So probably the best thing that I could do and other pet owners could do is come down to the blood drive, the blood drive get our pet tested. If it can donate at the time, that's great but also be on that list for emergencies in case you have, it's almost like a person. Absolutely. If you have that surgery, it's got to happen if there's no blood. Mm-hmm. Yep. That is a, a huge gift. Now, how do you publish, how do you publicize that to the general public? Because I, I wonder how many people even realize mm -hmm. that there's a need for dog and cat blood and how they can donate. So how do, you, how do you get that out? That's your job, right, yeah, Bill? So that's why one of the reasons why we partnered with you know, the American Red Cross and, and other human uh, blood organizations because then uh, it helps really connect uh, those two uh, causes together. And people say, oh, you know, like I understand the need for human blood. And also I see that these guys are doing it for dogs and cats as well. I didn't even think of that. So that connection there is, is helpful. Um, and we also will talk about this with um, our community of clients and uh, an extended, you know, people that, that pay attention to the you know, Vets website and everything like that. So we put that message out there um, so that those people also know. And those are primarily how we are getting the word out about um, the need for dog and cat blood. Do the general practitioner type vets, do they have the same access to blood that you do or do they come to you for supplies if, they're, if they have an issue? I think they come to us for supplies. Yeah, for the most part, the um, we do um, we do have blood available for any veterinarian who needs it. So if they need a unit of blood, um, we can provide that for them. A lot of times, um, the conditions that require transfusions are also conditions that require, e you know, either specialty care or twenty-four hour care. So a lot of times, if they do need blood, they're getting um, those veterinarians might refer to our hospital so that they not only get the blood product but all the other things that we have to offer. At the hospital. Yeah, I noticed. I remember when my daughter's uh, dog needed to have surgery, it was done by the vet, and then we transported her to Maple Shade, to your facility in Maple Shade, because you could offer that extended 24 hour care that, and she ended up with a blood transfusion, mm -hmm. come to think of it. Uh, you ended up with that. You were able to take care of her where she would not have been able to get the 24 hour care that was there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break and uh, be back with Dr. Hammer and with Phil shortly. This is Pet Patrol, Protector of the Pack, and we'll be back with you in a couple moments. Welcome back to Pet Patrol, Protector of the Pack. This is Alan Brassel, your host, and again with me today, Phil Barnes from North Star Vets and Dr. Kim Hammer from North Star Vets. Uh, question for you, the What's, people tend to always look for why should I do something and they don't always do it just for the altruistic and, and, and good reasons that it's a good thing to do. What, what else can, does someone get out of donating blood or having their dog do blood? What's in it for them, I guess they might ask. I'll defer to Dr. Hammer. So, um, so part of the screening process is a um, extensive panel of blood work. Um, that we do that looks at all of the um, kidney function, liver function, thyroid hormone levels, um, heartworm, and that's done once a year. And then in addition to that, we do extensive infectious disease testing that lets us know, one, that the blood is safe to give to another pet, but two, lets you know that your pet does not have any infections that we should be treating. Um, so that happens on a yearly basis, and that blood work is um, probably cost 500 plus dollars to run, so that's a, a benefit. The other benefit is that every time your cat or dog comes in to give blood, it has a full examination by a veterinarian. And it is extremely rare, but every so often we pick up something that may not be seen um, because a pet is in between their yearly visits to their regular veterinarian. And, um, and so I think that's a, a benefit also besides the, the feel good feeling. <laughs> and I'm thinking what you said, I mean, the, just, the, just the fact that they get a complete blood workup mm -hmm. uh, and the value of that financially as well as for the value of the health of the pet. 
Right. It, was, it was absolutely fantastic. And that is all free. Yeah, we, that is a benefit of the program. Okay, so I've got one, two, three, do four dogs mm -hmm. and five cats. So for those of you who are doing the math, I could probably mm -hmm. save, <laughs> in addition to what I've already spent, probably about $4,500 a year and do something really good. So we'll see you in June. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will, without a doubt. <laughs> I'll be coming with the van. <laughs> Everybody will be coming over. So, uh, Phil, tell us how people can reach out to you and to North Star and all the good contact information because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions, especially yeah. for those who just realized nine dogs times $500 is <laughs> $4,500 worth of work that needs to be done that you're getting it because you're doing the right thing. But yeah. how can they reach out to you? Uh, well, we definitely encourage people to check out the June 23rd and the June 29th events. Uh, if you can't make those events, we still want you to be participating in these because this is important all year round. And so people can go to www.northstarvets.com and click on the blood bank section right in the main navigation. Uh, there's information about what the requirements are. Um, and there's also the pre-screening uh, survey there. And that's what we want people to take first uh, before they decide if they're going to come out. So go to the website, northstarvets.com click on that blood bank tab and take that pre-screening process. Um, and if you have questions, you can reach out directly to Dr. Hammer uh, via email at bloodbank at northstarvets.com. So at the bloodbank.northstarvets.com email address, um, you can ask questions or you know, get more information uh, about the process. Uh, again, our phone number is 609-259-8300 if you have to get in touch with us at North Star Vets. So that's what we want people to do. Great. Great. Question for you. One last question. I always like to ask this one. Something unique that has happened while you've been doing this that you will never forget? Because we all have those experiences, so, oh my God, mm -hmm. experiences. Anything unique or outstanding with uh, someone who brought their favorite pet in to be a donor? Uh, to be a donor. I think. Um, one of the, the things that, you know, there are certain families that you get to know really well and some of the real special people are the Greyhound families who um, work in Greyhound Rescue, but um, as some people may know, Greyhounds um, make exceptional blood donors, both due to their temperament and their very high red blood yeah. cell count. So we have a close relationship with Greyhound Friends of New Jersey and, um, and all the people who have adopted Greyhounds and bringing their, their pets in. And we just recently had some greyhounds who retired a year or two back out of the program and she just adopted a new greyhound and contacted us to have her her young sally join the program so we're super excited about that well that's great yeah they keep keep it in the family yeah, absolutely yeah. yeah keep it in the family yeah any uh words of wisdom last thing again because people we, we may forget you want a dog that has good temperament and what are the characteristics again for a good dog and and for a good cat yeah, yeah. So, so we really, um, so as we had mentioned, good temperament, not being scared to come to the veterinarian. For dogs, we want them to be 50 pounds or more and between the ages of one and eight years old. For cats, we'd like them to be 10 pounds or more and between the ages of one and eight years old. We want them to be healthy and obviously we do a lot of the screening to make sure they're healthy, but we'd like them to not have any chronic conditions or be on any chronic medications. And we do um, look at things on a case-by-case -case basis, but, um, but for the most part, we want them to be healthy on regular flea um, and tick preventive, regular heartworm preventive. And um, and those and then just availability. So be uh, you know you as a, a pet owner be available and willing to, to bring your pet in you know a certain number of times a year to do that donation. And again, 50 pounds or more in a dog. Is there a mm -hmm. reason why a, a lighter weight dog might not be a good donor? If we take too much blood from them, they uh, okay. <laughs> oh, that could be a complete shutdown. Yeah. Exactly. That would be an epiphany. <laughs> exactly. They might need the transfusion back. We don't want to have that situation. <laughs> okay. So. Um, but there are some dogs who are in the 40 to 50 pound range who we will do the half unit um, so that they can still be a blood donor um, and, and we don't have to take as much blood, but still very much needed. Okay. Well, I want to thank both of you very much. I really appreciate your joining us today. Uh, this was an education. You just narrowed down my dog count by two, <laughs> down to two who are fatties, and two who between them couldn't come up with 50 pounds. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I, th I think that's incredible what you're doing. Uh, it, it educated me on the importance, having had a dog that needed blood transfusions at one point, 
I probably thought it magically just showed up. And folks, it doesn't magically show up. Show up. It's up to us to participate and help. And there's a lot that we get back when we do something like this. So thank you again. Thank you. Hopefully for we'll have you. I, hopefully we'll have you back on. I, I learn something new every time you folks. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for um, for us from Pet Patrol, protector of the pack, and we will see you next time.